rolling conversation. Um, and uh, welcome to this rolling and ongoing conversation, uh, which we have tried to really make more and more into an ongoing conversation. And this is definitely a step in that direction. Under started, oh God, uh, almost a year ago in the beginnings of the pandemic, where we were just trying to figure out what the hell are we doing? How do we prepare for this? Originally, it was me trying to ask a bunch of questions around drama schools and what drama schools need to be doing at this time. But soon enough, the conversations, like all great theater conversations, spread um, and became this idea of, well, you know, what is our purpose as theater, theater practice um, for this unrehearsed future? And we was joined by Amy, who went on to curate some eight beautiful, eight or ten beautiful conversations towards the second half of the first season. And then we were joined by the University of Cape Town through the lovely two interlocutors, Moenya and Geni. And we've had a kick-ass season uh, so far. I mean, uh, and they're all, all the conversations are available on HowlRound in the US, uh, there's a website, and all the conversations are available on the Unrehearsed Futures page. The recordings, if you don't have time for the recordings, Falguni, who's sitting here amongst us, has written these amazing journalistic reportage pieces of each conversation. They're about four or five pages long, so you could read those instead and then decide you want to listen to the recording. So it's all there and it's all in the public domain for you to just, I hope, have your mind totally stimulated and sparked off. Uh, and this is the 10th conversation and of the second season and we decided to change the format and I leave Moenia to explain all of that to you. Welcome one and all and we hope to hear many of your voices today. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here from your various places in the world, particularly if it is an ungodly hour for you. Thank you. <laughs> um, as Jehan has said, this is a special sitting of Unrehearsed Futures um, in that, you know, if you've joined before, you'll know that we usually have a guest or two uh, who one of the curators hosts uh, and who leads a kind of conversation. And we don't have a, we don't have a, we don't have that today. Um, and instead the invitation is for all of us in the room to be in conversation with each other. And what we thought we'd do, um, partly to mark the 10th uh, episode of season two, um, is to take the opportunity to do some collective reflecting, I suppose, as, as individuals and as an unrehearsed futures community on where we find ourselves as educators, as theater makers in this time in the context of the pandemic in particular, uh, and to use our three broad themes as um, a way to do this reflecting. Um, so the, the themes are plurality, planetarity, and possibility. And for today, we want to add moment, this idea of um, a moment, the moment that we're in, the moment that we are um, called to respond to in various ways, whether we like it or not. Um, and the idea is that, yeah, it's a, it's a community conversation. So the chat is always available. Um, the, uh, each of my fellow co-curators has some thoughts or provocations on each of these themes that they will share with us as a, really as a door opening uh, for any of us to step through and kind of take the conversation where we would like to. But to begin with, just to kind of um, warm ourselves up a bit and do some associative riffing, um, I would uh, I want to invite you to share what your immediate associations are with these terms, either in the chat, just a word or two that comes to mind immediately when you think of any of these terms, planetarity, possibility, plurality, and the moment. And it's not something to overthink, it's really something to, you know, interested in what your immediate associations are. So if anyone would like to uh, share, raise your hand, use the icon and feel free to get the, the chat going. Right, it is already. Mm. Mm. 
practices are wonderful. So, so far we have breaking boundaries, being with, holistic, breaking out and breaking in, theater's grand potential, what is now. Might have missed a few, let's see. Social jazz, hello. We might need to do some explaining there. That's a fabulous term. This moment has allowed events like this to happen. This global sharing, absolutely. Possibility, dialogue, collaboration, new narratives. What is now exciting potentiality, local globality. Nice, very nice. Repetition of possibilities and moments. The door needs to be opened again and again and again. I really love that. Planetarity equals globalization without the horrors. And then embracing globality. Great, lovely. And these can absolutely continue as you presence of others, I witnessing each other, beautiful. Yes, I also really enjoy the globalization without the horrors. Um, to get us into, so please feel free to keep adding, keep adding, keep sharing, keep um, bouncing off each other there in the chat. I wanted to ask Amy if um, you can kind of lead us, start with the thoughts you have, um, the provocations that you're sitting with at the moment, um, into, yeah, to kind of, into wherever we will go. Hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. I, I'd be happy to do that, um, Wenya. And, and I also want to really thank the people in the room from, for coming. And I invited a number of you uh, personally, and I really appreciate you turning up. Um, I really want to hear what you think about these, uh, these words and this, this uh, topic and this moment. Um, it seemed important to me to have the conversation because I had noticed from last year when we started uh, Unrehearsed Futures that there seemed to be a kind of, for me, exhilarating moment where we all seemed to feel that we were in the same boat. It was, it kind of operated like an alien invasion, always hypothetically would have, we sort of suddenly seemed to sort of really twig to the fact that we were all the same species, that we could all be killed by the same virus, that we all had aged parents, that we all needed vaccination, that we all needed to isolate, that we couldn't hug each other, that we had the same challenges. Um, it seemed a, like a terrible uh, way of bringing us together. Um, and as somebody who's lived uh, sort of very life in diaspora, just moving all the time, it seemed to me to bring, uh, it was satisfying in a way, I have to say, that, that I could suddenly use this new um, technology to have a global community. Uh, whereas before when I left, I always felt that I had really left and that people sort of forgot about me. Suddenly I was able to reconnect with people that I hadn't seen in years on Zoom. And it seemed like a, it, it really did something for my social life actually. Um, and Unrehearsed Futures was really thrilling because it, it brought that uh, feeling of community onto a collegial level. And I felt that we were all sort of thinking together and it, it, it seemed truly exciting. And then as soon as the vaccinations started to emerge um, the disparities started to reemerge, and with even more divisions, with even more kind of fragmentations. Um, and uh, now with this kind of, um, what seems to me a kind of hype about going back to normal, which I think at the time we were even saying, there's no normal anymore. How could we ever conceive of a normal after this? It seems that that, that hypnosis of the normal has, has, um, has, has really kind of um, taken over in some cases. And you know, with understandable frustration, having spent so long in lockdown, et cetera. So I just wanted to, I wanted to ask, you know, what what we think we can do as a planetary theater community, um, if we think there's something important about what we've been living through this moment, if there's anything we can do to extend it. Um, it seems that it is entirely appropriate to things that are ongoing, even if the whole world gets vaccinated uh, successfully against this mutating virus. We still have environmental change. We have the uh, proliferating and intersectional global justice movements um, and social justice movements. I mean, these are these aren't going away. These aren't going to get. We're not going to get vaccinated against those things. Those need a global uh, task force. They need global thinking. What can we do? Um, to extend the moment? What can we do to uh, extend our relationships with each other at the very least and to, but to also think into our practice? Um, how can the digital become part of same space without 
nullifying same space as we go back to, I mean, there's just, I just wanted to ask the question basically. And, um, and yeah, so thanks for hearing me that be happy to have at this point, any thoughts that might come up from that. If you want to, you. you want to raise so your hands, you. that's a, yeah, cool. If you if you want to raise your hands, we we want very much for this to be a discussion. So we're we're just sort of lobbing we're lobbing our thoughts into the room, but we're not expecting to dominate the conversation. We're just doing it to sort of help it get rolling, essentially. Please, Camille. Yeah, I hope you guys can hear me. I've got this Bluetooth on, so it'll make it easier. Um, yeah, I've been, I've been really having some interesting conversations with friends lately and even my, my way of being critiqued or critiquing um, the things we say because it's so connected with what matters in life right now as far as vaccinations and things like that. And I've had some difficult conversations with friends too where we've, we've become kind of contentious and everything. And I find that I get to know friends very quickly when, I, when, when, we, when we face each other's criticism and we still stay in the same room. And I've lost a couple friends too in this last year. Um, confirmed losses too, right? Like we've gotten back with each other and said, we still, we wanna be friends? And we say, no, okay, good. And we separate. So, but it, it, it does help me recognize that um, uh, it's an intimacy when you criticize someone. And it's an intimacy when you criticize their work because you put some time into it. And now you're actually breaking through all that to say, yeah, but I don't like this, or I don't like that. So. It, it, it always struck me as something that's very intimate yet very um, uh, destructive, um, like radioact radioactivity. You know, you, you, is there some central truth to radioactivity that we are always shielding ourselves from? Um, and so it's just interesting for me to kind of engage in that kind of conversation about really difficult conversations that can break you up, but instead you stay in the same room. Wonderful, thank you. Kyla. Hi, sorry, I'm multitasking, which is ironic for what I'm about to say. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I just wanna say that I think one of the highlights of my, of this in the last couple of years has been the Unrehearsed Futures um community and and conversations i joined quite late in the game i think but um then proceeded to be incredibly inspired and reinvigorated around uh, uh our practice and as we discussed in our session when yeah i mean we birthed to school during the pandemic um which has long been on our to-do list um and have never had the time so i guess i and, and that really afforded some spaciousness, you know, 2020 afforded some spaciousness that I have never before experienced in my career uh, and in the ongoing um, hustle of being a creative in Johannesburg, uh, the hustle to survive, the hustle to network, um, the never ending hustle that doesn't even end when you go to sleep you know, um, is just, just always, always ongoing. So I would say from this moment, I have really begin to understand slowing down. Um, and I mean, it was, we were forced to slow down, but, but really embracing slowing down and seeing what benefits for both myself personally speaking and myself as an artist and a creator, how, how much that has transformed me really and allowed me space to look at things that I haven't done. I mean, I've just turned 40 and I would say that probably for the last 20 years, I have not been looking at things. I've just been doing, going, 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 going. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I, I'm just really appreciative for this ref reflective time and this, um, this spaciousness in order to I mean, I have not, I think uh, my, my experience has been somewhat different from my peers in that a lot of people have been furiously creating in this time in the digital space. And I have not, I have been really um, not 
not lured into the digital space. And, and that's also been refreshing for me to, to go, why am I not lured to the digital space? Why do I find it difficult to watch things online or participate in things online? Or, and then like a reaffirming of my practice as live performance and live and teaching in person and feeling very guilty and ashamed at first of like, and feeling like an underachiever and like I'm not actually... I'm not really avant-garde enough for this new time. <laughs> and then sort of relaxing into it and being like, well, no, it's okay. I am who I am as a practitioner and I, uh, I'm i drawn to liveness. And yeah, so a, a, a reaffirming of that and then a sort of like settling into the, becoming ready for that when that time is allowed to us again. So for us again so yeah I, I I feel like this last couple of years has been spacious and reflective and looking at seeing listening and becoming ready thank you thank you it's a great place to um <laughs> to to end on what you're saying because the, the becoming ready part I guess feels like the, the one of the big um, one of the big things to figure out how to contend with. I wonder what it is that we are becoming ready for, you know, as as individuals and as a, you know, as um, communities of sorts. Uh, so thank you for ending there. Also wanted wanted to pick something up. Camilla, you were talking about um, intimacy and and uh, destruction, and it also made me think of particular. Um, what I thought were cl quite close friendships that have not survived in this time. Um, and uh, it, it reminded me of um, when I had kids also, and there were friendships there that I was surprised didn't survive, that there are these transition moments that occur that are testing of particular intimacies that um, at some level get, are taken for granted until, um, you know, and, until that's just not possible. So. Adicia, please. Oh. Well, do you I, I do find that, um, like, that you've had um, uh, developments in personal relationships that where, where you actually end up getting have gotten closer to people over the past over the past year? Uh, I find that that has happened to me a fair bit. You know, people who live in different parts of the world whom I haven't been able to sort of connect with the way I hoped. Now you know we, there was there was this whole year where a lot of people had time. You had you had, and and you know your your conversation sort of rose above the perfunctory. You know how's it going? I'm doing well because no one's really doing well at this point, right? And then that is an instant connect which helps uh, deepen your relationship. Do you, did you not find that also to be the case? Is that directed to come in or to me? Um, you know, I, I think you were the one who said um, where you, some of the relationship sort of, uh, you know, yeah. fell apart or sort of grew distant. So uh, did yeah. you the opposite was also true? Because it was definitely so in, in my case, of course, both ways. Yeah, I was, I was separating from Facebook uh, and a few other trying to social media. I couldn't separate from YouTube, unfortunately. Uh, which is probably a, uh, the worst thing, I think, as it turns out. But uh, yeah, I was separating from social media, so I, I didn't quite find it that way. But uh, yeah, there were certainly people I hadn't talked to in a while that we just kind of struck up a new conversation about things. How you go? How you doing? People got kids now. And so in that way, we kind of found a, a new route to being another kind of friendship, which I think, you know, if you have certain friendships, they're kind of spring loaded that way. You know, you meet somebody 30 years ago and you get a chance to see them off and on. And then you finally get a chance to read, you know, everything slowed down. So now all of a sudden you're just like, so what's going on with you? What's been, what's been happening in the last 30 years? So that's been kind of beautiful in that way. I'm sure everybody can relate to that. Um, yeah. And that's been beautiful in that way of being like encouraging when the, when the, when the real close friendships break up or the friendships that you assumed were close because you stay in contact with them year after year. They do a good job of staying in contact with you. They keep you involved with their family. And then you just come across some rough patches with either political or libidinal things, right? Stuff that you never got straight because you guys have always had your contentions around this issue. And now you're grown ups, And now you're like, you still talking to me like that? Are you still, you know, you're still going to, 
you're still going to think that way about the way we are? You know, because you always assume somebody knows you better when you know them long enough, and they don't, you know. They stay in their pocket, and you stay in your pocket potentially. And if you're lucky enough, you jump into a new, completely different pool with a new ecology and different temperature, and you're able to kind of not tear each other apart like fish that don't know each other at all. But more often than not, sometimes maybe just by virtue of the silence or the fact that you haven't been stayed in touch, you, you, you've lost some 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 important connection. Anyway, I'm talking too much about it. It just made me think about this stuff. So I appreciate what you're saying. <laughs> and yes, it, it does it does instill a faith of optimism with me. Uh, in part of Thank you. Awesome. Um Aditya New Delhi, I think you were I didn't I didn't register that there were two of you, but at least you're in different places. Please go ahead and then I think Laszlo was next. Well, uh I, I like what uh, Aditya just mentioned about uh, this. I think there's some value to preserving this, whatever this is. I, I, and I don't know uh, how we look at it uh, in our times. I, I tend to look at it from an interesting conservative lens that it's sort of contractual uh, that, you know, uh, when you click on that meeting, you're, you're really like taking a step and you have the ability to get out of it whenever you want. So. That, that connection or uh, uh, is is entirely up to you and it prevents let's say uh, you know uh, a degree of violence that might occur in you know a slightly more politically charged environment uh, or uh, some some sort of a reflex response that might not be conducive uh, uh, in any way or form uh, it also reduces intimacy uh, but I but I think there's some long-term like value to just uh, seeing it how it plays out and, and what's worth preserving. And, and you know, like uh, uh, Kyla was talking about initially, there's definitely uh, more introspection on it. There's meditation on uh, what it brings to us, what, what, what's lost in the process. Uh, so I, I, I like that, you know, that that can be reframed in a more conservative light as well, just to see that, you know, it's being looked at and it's being uh, valued uh, in a certain way. Fabulous, thank you. Thanks for that. Laszlo. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, so Amy invited me. I'm one of the people Amy specifically invited and my response to her was, yeah, I'll come along, but I'm not sure if I have any interesting ideas to share or thoughts about this moment. And that's in part because of what's happened for me in this moment, which is, uh, I hope is worth sharing. I think it will, it touches on some of what people have said. Um, uh, two things. One is sort of, you know, is, have we lost the moment? I remember in the first few months of of being locked down here in the UK and having this conversation with people. Um, so I think it wasn't specific to us, but very, very particularly um, in the university system here, it felt like there was this moment and we talked about it generally that where anything you did was enough. Right. There was this kind of expansive sense of if you just if you just just come. And if you come for five minutes and you can't handle it, shut the Zoom, leave, no problem. And that was true for our students and it was true for all of our colleagues. And it, was, it felt very expansive and holistic and non-hierarchical. And there was this, this sense of like, okay, and we can find something new in this moment. And that was when I read the provocation for this meeting, I thought that's immediately what I thought of, have we lost that moment? And that's sort of what Amy started to say. Uh, in some of her pro provocation in the beginning. And it lasted for a little while and we were all working with the students and we were working with each other and we were even to some degree, or it seemed as though we were working with the uh, executive above us. And then quite quickly though, that shut down. And it shut down on every level. It shut down from the executive. They would tell us they weren't gonna pay any attention to the national student survey scores, for instance, and then suddenly they were. Uh, and I won't, the litany of what those things were is not worth, they were all the same. And the students as well, the students uh, being trained into, and their mental health being really rough, being trained into blaming us for when they were and were not able to come into the university. So I do think, I don't know how that moment would have stayed open, but it was this moment that, that Amy described, where, where we all were in the same boat and there was this, this sense that that all systems were in where I am anyway, were, were, were sort of agree, in agreement. And I wonder how, no, I don't wonder how, I don't know how we have that 
in the larger, um, uh, in the current now this moment and in the going forward moment, which leads me to what I, this is like really scary to say in front of people I don't know. I'm just, a and this year and a half has been like, I can't, no, I will not do this to the students. I will not do this to myself. I will not do this to my colleagues. The fact is, and I've got some ideas for what to do instead. And I don't know what that means to me as an arts practitioner. So I'm, so this moment now is very, is liminal and is on an edge. And I don't know, it's, it has enormous amount of possibility, but towards, but it, for, for how, for what I don't know. But that's what has happened for me. And, and lockdown just kind of made, it didn't change in terms of the situation of academia, et cetera, it didn't change anything. It just exaggerated at first, a lot of the good, and then it felt like all of the bad. And it nailed the coffin for me, basically. Something could change over this next year. Well, I'm, but I. It doesn't mean I'm necessarily done with creating in the world, but I have no idea what that looks like next. So I, I guess I see some nods and <laughs> I'm, I'm presuming, and I know there's tons of, of, of blogs happened too, um, but I am curious to, um, to yeah, that, that is what is the moment and the potential of what is a missed possibility, which obviously means other possibility, right? But uh, for me, it's very precipice. I have no idea what it is. Thank you for listening. That's the first time I've said that out loud to anybody I'm not close to. <laughs> thank you, Laszlo, thank you so much. I feel like you've articulated something that is definitely front of mind for me personally at the moment. And as you say, shared by a, a whole range of arts practitioners across the world. Ah, thank you. It's quite a relief, actually, to hear it said out loud <laughs> by someone else. Um, yeah, thank you and welcome. Welcome. Uh, for me, please go ahead. And then um, Aurelian, is that how I pronounce your name? Okay, it'll do. Thank you. <laughs> go ahead for me. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Laszlo. Um, I have, we missed a moment. I wonder what it was in the moment that... Um, made us able to be that expansive. I really resonated with, you, with what you said, Laszlo. Um, was it that we have all found ourselves on the same level and therefore we had no, there was nothing to um, protect and therefore there were no hierarchies to protect and therefore we could give and we could receive and we could make allowances for and we could support and we could be, was, was it that and is, and if we are able to capture the thing that enabled that kind of connectivity and empathy, um, then we haven't lost a moment. Maybe we can take some of that forward in some way, and maybe not in the university in directly, but you know, we can take it forward in some way. Um, I just wanted to also talk about some of the shifts. Uh, I'm just extending what you know, what my colleagues here have said, some of the shifts that have happened as a result of the pandemic. And one was around disciplines, you know, as a, as a teacher of the performing arts, um, there was live performances about to happen and then there was a lockdown. We had to film the live performances and um, do the end of year show online. And then there was a debate as to was this screen dance or was this digital theater or what was this? And it made me see the politics around knowledge production and the arguments that began there. Because as I was filming my choreographies, I found I was trespassing on the territory of screen dance. And that, that was difficult because we were also trying to set up a screen dance course. Do you see what I mean? So then what is screen dance if everything is filmed? You know, and this became, 
this has all sorts of economic and um, political things in a university system, which I became aware of how knowledge production is being shifted and also how new forms of um, networking and groups were happening. And I found that the positive of it is that you could find um, groups online with whom you shared the same values or value in relation to something. So it wasn't just, you didn't have to just work with people who were contrary to you. You could actually seek out a group of people with the same values. They could come from anywhere in the world and they were brought together because of the same issue. They had the same interest or the same issue or the same heart towards that issue. I thought that was very valuable. Like this group, for example, when I stumbled on this group, you know, um, it, it, it wouldn't have been possible without the pandemic. So there was new forms of, um, of, of, uh, of groupings and that gives me hope because I think therefore new forms of collaboration can emerge um, where people are more aligned with the, with the, um, with what they're trying to achieve. And I think that's something that this moment has uh, given us. And I think we haven't lost that we can take, take on. Thank you. Thank you. Orlean and then Ketana, Adiata, Mumbai, New Delhi. Hi. Um yeah, I, I just really kind of, I don't know, want to share my, I guess, my own experience of this time. Um, it was quite interesting looking at it from the terms of, you know, physical sort of space that um, we inhabit, uh, which we sort of constructed throughout all our lives, which are some of them are longer like mine, some of them not so. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, this pandemic hits and this whole construct sort of caves in. And not just in the physical space, but in the mental space. And I sort of found myself kind of locked up with my family, with my closest, you know, closest and dearest. And that relationship really deepened, you know, and I sort of really reconnected with my family, first of all. And that was a really positive thing. I found myself in this little bubble. Um, and then you sort of, so it's interesting in terms of the dynamic, you know, it sort of caves in and you're in this little, little bit. And then slowly you sort of start coming out of this bubble, but something's changed and you start looking out into the world. And funny enough, thanks to things like Zoom, you actually all of a sudden start looking much further than you looked before. And there's a, this, the space sort of took an interesting dynamic. It really got stretched. There's this inward movement. Um, so your inner space changes. And, you know, Lecoq people know the Lecoq bubble that really sort of changed, you know, your personal bubble. Um, but then all of a sudden it got stretched outwards and all of a sudden you reach out and, you know, through teaching, I sort of reached people and places that I never reached before. Um, and so I don't know, I'm sort of, um, I'm trying to be positive, I guess, and um, hopefully, you know, make the most of it and hopefully we can we can sort of embrace that um uh and that there's you know interesting talk with um jihan and things about sort of this this sort of global um drama school global teaching global university rather than these little bubbles where things happen and little bubbles happen here in these rooms and sort of a mix of the two i think it's, it's embracing that that outwardness that globality but then also you're in a, in a thing, and I don't, I'm not quite sure how to combine the two yet, but um, there's something really interesting within that. And if we, can, if we can harness that newfound energy um, and dynamic, I think there's some, some, yeah, there's some potential there. That's all I'm gonna say for now. Thank you for listening and great to be here. Wonderful, thank you. Katana, please. Yes. Um, all right, so I'm trying to gather my thoughts and I'm also trying to uh, connect them with things that have been said. But I find that I, where I am now is a very different place from March 2020. And the way that I look at my students and the way that I look at theater making has really the, the optimism of 
March 2020, where I was completely willing to embrace the online space. I had no problem. This was the uh, this was the space that my students anyway had inhabited for more than 10 years now. I, I wasn't averse to it. But right now, uh, when Amy invited me personally, the last week I said I wouldn't attend because I was still reeling from the death by suicide of one of my young students. But today I said I would come in here because I was really curious about how we're going to make things different for young people and in what ways we're going to uh, really tackle issues of mental health and tackle issues of mental health within the digital space. Because I don't, personally, I don't, I'm not keen on going back to the old um, hierarchies. I'm not keen on the old, um, the verticalities that existed before the pandemic. I, I personally wish to embrace this way and go forward. But within this, what is what are the gatekeepers and who are the gatekeepers and what are the inequalities that are inherent to this space is what makes me curious right now. And I've been in Germany for a couple of months during the pandemic and had a series of conversations much like this. And I feel that the new conversations really have to be in between uh, theater makers and uh, coders, for example, because of one of the conversations I had was with Helena Valley Jameson of Magdalena Project. And they're really working to get artists to own spaces much better so that the liveness of our performance or the, the risk that we take with performance also has an equality or an equity built into it. And that we're not functioning in places such as Zoom, which already has inherent gatekeeping and there's an inherent politics within that. That's number one. Number two, I'm really, uh, I feel terribly invested in the local. So when you say planetarity, it's great. And uh, on an abstract level, I get it. And yes, I'm with it. But I really am into reinforcing and supporting the local at a very, very primary level right now. So um, yeah, that's it. That's my contribution. And uh, thank you, Amy and Jehan. I, it, it is really, this is one of the ta big takeaways has been having these conversations across the across the globe. I'm just trying to see how I make sense of it politically and for the global south and for my local going forward. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Kirtana, for being here with all that you're holding at the moment. Uh, we can go ahead uh, to Aditya, Mumbai, New Delhi, and then Bongeni, and I'm not going to come in in between. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I, I think at the outset, uh, for me, um, you know, the, the, the feeling of um, optimism with regards to our, our global unity didn't really exist because I think it's a natural human tendency to sort of band together in the face of external obstacles. In this case, a global pandemic, when the obstacle goes away, that is the common enemy is no longer present, we tend to return to divisions of old. But um, I think that's where the, the, the point about the possibility comes in, right? We see the possibility that this moment brought. And when it comes to planetarity, um, I just want to sort of um, speak about a friend of mine who lives in an occupied territory, um, but I mean, who, who, who hails from an occupied territory, but lives in, in London. He regularly posts political content on the internet, partakes in protest marches and the like. But now what he started also doing is he hosts hour-long sessions where he plays the music of the country of his origin. And he discusses it in depth as well. Of course, this may be seen as an act of political resistance too, but it's, it's, it's more than that. You know, him, him and his people do not simply want to be known as victims who reside in or hail from a war zone. They're a living, breathing community with art, food, and culture of their own, you know, and, and outside of this prevalent identity of victims. So now, of course, the war and the occupation has had an influence in the shaping of the culture, but there are more contributing factors to it. Now, to me, that is where the question of planetarity comes in, right? And it kind of speaks to Kirtan's point about, uh, you know, the, about, 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 paying attention to um, the local, you know, when you, when you're able to represent or when a, when a marginalized or an underrepresented community is able to sort of tell their stories above and beyond highlighting the strife and the difficulties that they face. 
and if these stories are preferably told by uh, people of those communities or by allies who devoted the necessary time and energy into understanding the world that they belong to i think in 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 this sense is really where the question of planetarity comes in for me and 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 to understand that i think you know we've seen we've seen we've seen over the past year the possibilities that it can bring i think it's 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 really about holding on to that and and moving forward in 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 ways that can you know that we can apply into in in the real world you know um as in as in the example i just uh, mentioned well uh, i i've been thinking about this idea of planetarity and like where does it bring value to us and specifically me like how has it brought value to me in the last year or so uh, i think for me it started with uh, you know one of the workshops with dsm me me took it and uh, you know that was the start of that and i just if i look back then and and now i just you know i, I feel like this is uh, coming from you know an outside a uh, world like not somebody who's not from the world of theater i feel like this is it this is my formative theater education you know i've i uh, there's no other way to have it uh, i have i'm still in that 9 to 5 structure so i'm you know eking time out stealing time from my office work to sort of come here and and do this uh, but uh, you know this uh, this is uh, what it's going to be uh, and uh, uh, you know there's there's real value in that uh, i uh, personally feel that you know even before like in the film world uh, when i thought of myself as a writer you know you still uh, all of us uh, even as actors we we be thinking of ourselves at uh, the mercy of some form of uh, like hierarchy or institution where you know you've written a script and it's passed along and you're like oh yeah we'll realize it we'll, we'll you know bring it to life so your job's done but but i feel like at least with this there's you you, you really see yourself as the center of an artistic piece of work uh, uh there's the the caution there is of narcissism i guess to a certain degree but but i still feel that you know at least you see yourself as a fuller artist who's sort of trying to juggle these pieces who's widening uh, his horizons in terms of what is uh, meant to be in a, a larger artistic uh, you know product uh, and and it's and i feel that that's really valuable that uh, that's a seminal moment at least for someone like me who's still like you know working in the rigors of the traditional 9 to 5 job and and holding that space but trying to also see like what else is out there in the crevices and uh, in the different spaces that we find in the middle so uh, that for me is uh, really deep value Um yeah colleagues thank you so much for all these really really rich thoughts um i'm trying to kind of um pull these threads together in some ways um you know as you know everything is already entangled right um so the side of possibility plurality um planetarity it's very difficult to speak, talk about the one without invoking the others and and it's already been happening in the conversation that that we've had um and you know if if i begin here by riffing on this idea of planetarity of, as you know steve articulated it um whether we kind of buy into it or not it's this idea that counterposes the planetary against the global and in marx's terms right it's a negation in some ways of um the alienation produced by capital so it is framed by a kind of i guess ethical response maybe ethical might be the wrong word um to this equilibrium and 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 the kinds of um global orientations and positions of power that that ultimately you know kind of sustain this disequilibrium across different kind of um spaces in the world so what i've been hearing here though um you know uh, i think it was comedy who brought up intimacy first um as a thought and then uh somebody else used the empathy as well and i'm wondering whether in our thinking here what we aren't trying to kind of reach towards or what we aren't trying to imagine as an expression of planetarity is is reaching for a kind of radical intimacy or a kind of radical empathy um in that it's about recognizing our closeness to one another 
but without consuming the other entirely in order to erase specificity and difference. And it's a, in my head, a, a relatively complicated proposition to make. And I, I, you know, I, I can't help but look at the screen and, and recognize the multiple kind of different lo global locations from which we come. Um, there's a way in which the Zoom moment um, and, and the kind of compulsion to move online has definitely forged, as you've all pointed out, these, these really interesting ways um, that perhaps has expanded our networks, has expanded our capacity to connect to places in the world that we might not have connected to before. And I wonder the degree to which that has produced maybe the impression that we are somehow in a more intimate space. But actually, it's 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 a kind of not image. It's it's a it's sorry, language is failing me right now. Um, is the space kind of suggests an intimacy that isn't actually there, which is why I'm 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 kind of. Uh, modifying the word and adding this term kind of radical in front of it is recognizing that this actually isn't a moment of intimacy in in that way particularly but is we need to push to recognize um position perspective and not try and resolve difference to not try and kind of smooth out differences but to recognize how those very differences those kinds of um yeah, the, the, the different positions from which we come into the conversation are the very place where perhaps the real work can begin happening. Um, yeah, so it's, and, and it connects again to this idea of plurality for me as well, in that we are recognizing multiple different orientations, positions, subjectivities, and politics that in a kind of globalist framework are competing for primacy. But here we are. Again, not flattening out, not evening, not, not, not resolving, but recognizing the tensions between these things in order to imagine something else beyond that, where those don't become the overdetermining factor that shapes everything that we do. Uh, yeah, I'm just kind of, you know, kind of gripping at, at, at these little threads and, and, and I'm, I'm kind of stuck in this moment of, of what then a kind of radical intimacy or a radical empathy or a recognition of the other as an other to whom I'm always in relation without consuming them, without turning them into an object that is kind of distanced from us. Seems like a really powerful kind of place to maybe begin thinking in verb forms <laughs> around what planetarity could not necessarily be, but about how we begin doing the planetary, is about how we begin doing plurality. Fabulous, thank you so much. Um, told you I know your hand is up and uh, Nilofa had her hand up, I think, just before you. So would you like to go? Yes, go ahead, Nilofa, and then told you, and then for me, please. Um, hello, it's wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, great. It's wonderful to be here uh, uh, and uh, to hear all of you. Um, with everything that I was thinking of and struggling <laughs> throughout this year and even before then. Um, uh, so I just wanted to say a few things about what, what happened when we, when we had this experience over this whole year. Um, I, um, with the lockdown, I, I'm in Paris, but with the lockdown and the, uh, the stopping of all this uh, social, physical life, uh, I found myself in, uh, in uh, many, many meetings, uh, just like this one, where I get to see a lot of people uh, that normally I wouldn't see and talk to. So it for me, it's a very big experience of actually realizing something that I really wanted to realize out of my control, you know. Um, I don't know how many committees <laughs> I'm in, but we actually started acting, forming committees on racism, other committees on 
what, what do we do now <laughs> as theater makers? Uh, and uh, it became inevitable. This discussion became inevitable for everyone. Um, so um, uh, now, perhaps Paris is also a place where people like to discuss a lot of things and lots of words. But um, uh, from here, I find myself on a weekly basis discussing what we do post pandemic and uh, pre extinction, <laughs> you see. Uh, and with that, um, at the same time, I, I'll say what happens uh, afterwards, but um, uh, I'll give you an example of a miracle. Um, um, in my country, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, war and, and conflict. And uh, at, at one point, I'm talking about Syria and, and Turkey and the, that, that whole war between Kurdish people and, and uh, ISIS and all this. At one point, a, uh, a confederation uh, has been declared in that place. I don't know if you know, it's, it's called Rojava. And uh, in the middle of the war, um, people built a life where uh, a lot of uh, many different um, religions and, and uh, uh, groups and communities uh, live together. And uh, in, within this, this uh, confederation, they call it, they started a university, the University of Kabane. This is literally a university in a battle zone. Like literally there is war every day, bombs and things, drones coming in. And in, in a relatively safe place, there's a, a university. There's actually two now. There's Rojava University and Kobana University, uh, built by, uh, uh, with the help of, uh, I'll say, uh, Kurdish uh, people, a Syrian, uh, some Armenian people, uh, Arab people, and, uh, and different communities trying to make, push out forces to make a, a zone for them to live together in peace. And in a, and trying to figure out what that would mean in a daily basis, how to how to um, arrange themselves. So, in the last three months, I've seen Noam Chomsky giving a conference online in Rojava University. I'll, I'll try to remember people, but like the most important ones were Eric Fasan. Uh, from here, it's a person that who works a lot with performance embodiment and um, gender, who gave a conference in, in Rojava University. Uh, Zizek, the funny man who's um, the, talking a lot about critic of... Uh, we know uh, Zizek. Great, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I actually got to know him much better through <laughs> that university. <laughs> And now he is not allowed to enter uh, Turkey because he gave that conference in there. You see, this is a this is a, a, a miracle. Before this, I taught in that region. It's not possible. As soon as you do anything to help these people, you are socially dead for your life, for your whole lifetime in Turkey. You you couldn't have. It, it's it is quite amazing and. And um, who was talking about, about institutions? Um, so, so uh, I guess we are all <laughs> okay with that idea that we are all leaving university at this point or the academic um, ways of doing things. But this is another um, the in inevitable discussion. It's dead. Uh, uh, and um, uh, the fact that we work on with students with uh, with um, with a 
uh, trying to have a performance happening or like a, a, a end product or like a, a, a diploma or like a certificate that you need to get. All this idea is, is actually finished. And this is a great time to build a new one, isn't it? It's a great time to build a university in a battlefield. <laughs> it's a good time to build a new way of seeing the institution. And, uh, and I was, I, I wrote somewhere in the chat, I don't know anymore. Um, uh, Morton, uh, Fred Morton and Stefana Harney wrote um, a book called Someone Could Help Me Perhaps, um, Black Radical uh, Tradition, it's called. Uh, thoughts, some, something about thoughts on fugitivity and black study, something like that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, in that, uh, they, uh, they, they write at one point, the university is a place of pillage. You, you go in there, you take what you need and you run. Um, and uh, I've been teaching and studying with this <laughs> idea for years now. Um, uh, uh, and, um, Okay, sorry to be trying to find, put all the thoughts together to be presentable, but um, uh, my idea about teaching changed when I taught in that region because I started to realize that I, I don't know who I'm teaching for what future and I don't know what legitimacy I have as a teacher. So um, because of that, I had to reinvent all the classes that I was teaching because my teaching and the, my teaching wasn't legitimate and the future did not exist. You see, perhaps this is a, a thing to look at when we talk about the moment. Uh, uh, and a lot of people talk about relationality and rhizomic relations, right? Um, uh, I have a question for, for people, like, because when we talk about platinarity, right? Um, something, it, it's, it's all great. Uh, and I guess we try to uh, be careful that it doesn't become universal, it's, it's a planetary thing. Uh, I guess we are aware that, that universal has been a problem. Yeah, uh, but uh, I don't know how we negotiate uh, local sensitivities with that. So, I'm not saying Thank that you. it cannot happen, but yes. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, it, it's finished. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for all your thoughts. Um, uh, Tojo for me and Jehan, please go ahead. And then Kyla. Uh, so, hi, everyone. So, um, I was in, I think Amy was aware that when she invited me, I haven't been in academia in at least a decade. And, <laughs> and I have not been a practicing artist for even longer. However, um, you know, Amy and I go way back. And I guess a perspective I want to bring is that over the last year and a half, um, well, surprise, surprise, I'm in the US. So in terms of like the focus, it's been inward to all the strife within the context of the US. And what I found myself, um, a lot of the Zoom um, conversations I have are with classmates and colleagues who as artists have been grounded because there is no space to work. And therefore what has happened part uh, that has fascinated me because I have classmates who are opera singers to theater performers and the conversations that have been happening have been the ones finally looking at the um, systemic racism within the context of American theater from Broadway to the smallest place to, and, and that's what um, 
that's what I've been engaged with, with in, in conversations. And also just, um, um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm being very honest in that I feel like even though I am international, I'm multicultural, I'm a cultural chameleon, living in this country just by the nature of what it is, you know, it takes a focus inward within itself, which has, which is its own issues. Um, but I feel like something I, I noticed, I remember reading American theater a while ago, talking about theater in the age of Trump. And I think what is happening within the US is, we've never had a chance to even deal with the idea of theater within the age of Trump to where I find myself, which is, um, as I shared with Amy that, you know, that part of me that's like, okay, you got your MFA 20 years ago, what are you doing with it? Where is it? What are you doing with your art? Has been rekindled very hugely by the Black Lives Matter here. And I was just sharing with Amy uh, some ideas that, you know, what came out of George Floyd and that whole thing is ideas for theater, for, for, for stuff, for my own one-man show, for certain plays, for things that um, just, just to kindle in, within me the, 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 the need I have to create moving forward that wasn't as there strongly before. So it's a very, uh, and I should add, I'm a professor's kid. I've grown up in universities. I, I, was, I taught theater for about a semester and that was as much as I could deal with because I was like, not, I grew up in academia, I want to run away from it. I like to live in this space of, you know, like just critical thought and theory on the ground floor. And so what I found happening is, yes, Zoom is great because it's connecting with a lot of people. But what I found has been happening here is I have a lot of friends who we can't work right now, you know, and obviously I'm talking about like minorities and people of color. Not that I have, I mean, I have friends of all, all hues, but that focus um, in regards to like, this is a chance we get to talk about systemic racism within Broadway, within this, within that and how can we change the canon and stuff like that. That is what the focus has been. And um, yeah, I could add more to that. I'll leave that at that for right now. There's just a realization and I, it, it would be, it would be um, dishonest for me to pretend that at least from my point of view within this country there hasn't been an absorption and uh, you know like we had trump for a while and everything just taking things inward in a way that um i can't necessarily say is healthy but it is necessary uh in, in, in certain ways um for the artists that within reside within this country. I have enjoyed the, the idea of having conversation around like, let's talk about the elephant in the room because it is, we got time to, this is a time to talk about it, that things need to change. Um, uh, yeah, okay, that's enough for now. I don't know if that made sense, but that's kind of where my focus and my attention has been. I am literally in this space of like, my artistic sense of being reawakened from hibernation or you know when i was 20 i was like ah you know i was really ambitious i was going to convert all this uh, uh novels from the african writer series into plays and that arrogance i had back then it's like ah, i'm going to convert you know, like peter abrams mind boy i'm going to make that uh, you know that energy has been rekindled in my um well i'm not 20 anymore but the energy has been rekindled by just a just a a, 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 a a frantic the shock waves of the last year and a half of of being black and male in this country and other things okay that's enough for now thank you amazing you're getting a lot of love and support in the room for that rekindling for me please go ahead and jehan thank you i've been very inspired by today's conversation um i just want to say something very brief about um um, Bolini's, um provocation about radical intimacy, I feel that what he said really hit on me because I think that's what I was struggling to talk about, that this moment is forcing us to ask ourselves what intimacy actually is. And something like Moena was saying earlier, when transitions happen, then you think, 
what was the relationship based on anyway? It can't make this transition. What kind, what do our relationships need to be based on now? And when I gave the example about screen dance and digital choreography, um, on one level it's trite, on another level you're saying what makes one thing the other? What makes digital screen dance different from digital choreography? What's the essence we, we're going for? Should we? Is there something in either that we need to really understand because it's that that we need to translate into this space? And there's a lot in the chat about the falseness of Zoom, the mirages of, that, of, of intimacy that uh, this, um, that um, the digital space can, um, can create. So what is it that we have experienced in life before COVID that we need to mine, that we need to bring across? And I think this, this situation is just making us look deeper at what that is and really understanding it because without that, we can't we can't re we can't reimagine this space or re, re rework this space to make it a place where um, intimacy can happen and so i'm really just um yeah i'm really just um fired up by that idea of you know radical intimacy jehan go ahead thank you for um thank you uh listening to you guys it just sort of i kind of had some notes on the whole idea of possibility which was this you know fourth of this fourth idea but as as many realized and and i guess we realized in the conversation we're all looking for well, what is possible and what is next and what is the doing thing that we have to do um and the the i'm just gonna some thoughts out there, uh, maybe as provocations, but maybe also as as me trying to synthesize ideas. But I actually think that this medium, uh, despite the problems that everyone has mentioned, is it you know is there imagine is it fictitious or is there a mirage aspect to it? Where does real intimacy lie? Um, I was thinking about Camille's opening remarks about uh, you know the friends, and I just remembered that in the real world I have. I'll use this as an example. In the real world, I have friends who I don't see for 20 years, but then when I meet them, it's like two minutes had passed, right? And those are friends for, for keeps. And now I get to rediscover them. And this medium has allowed me to sort of have that, but whether I talk to them on Zoom every day or if I talk to them again for 20 years, that it, the dynamic there is already in place. Um, now this works two ways. One is this medium suddenly gives us a chance to have really new intimacies and new connections and find that quality of friends rather than the friends who are just here because of physical proximity and the, the, the discipline of meeting up all the time. Uh, but at the same time, um, it also, did I need to have that original relationship with the friend in the live space for me to then now have that sense of intimacy that I can have where, whether, whether it's on Zoom or in person, I can still make that connection. Or if I didn't have that initial friendship, which was very live and present. So I don't know the answer to that. And this is one of the questions we're going to have to grapple with. The other question I don't know about is this universality and plurality and globalization versus a kind of globalization, which is planetarity, where how do we stay with Kirtana's local and meaningfully but still have space and time in this conversation. But somewhere I feel like Kirtana being in this room, having this conversation with all of us, but knowing that somewhere that's going to impact what she does in her own space at home, somewhere in that dynamic is where the, the, the possible solution lies. Um, I think that we are all, and I'll be pre preaching to the choir when we talk about what we know theater can do and be for society. And I think in this moment that we are losing or not lost or continuing, um, this, this moment has shown me that there are many of us across the planet who, who, who know of the transformative power of theater and drama. And we also see in this upheaval that we're all having a universal experience through all of society now in different ways, uh, that there is, uh, there is a yearning, there is a questing by everyone, what next? is one such example, but I think many people are on that precipice in different ways within their own context. There's got to be something better. Um, we've had 
you know, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole mass population that has lost a relative or a friend or has been at a crematorium in India. Uh, and I can't imagine them not sitting there thinking the way things are is wrong. Something has to change. There has to be something different out there. And I just feel like we, and I'm not trying to put us on a pedestal here as theater makers, but we've always been dealing with resilience. We've been dealing with conflict. We've been dealing with staying in spaces where we have to sort of process experience in different ways. And we, we equip ourselves, or we, we, our medium and our work, uh, whether we're teaching it, whether we're practicing it, uh, requires us to have these skill sets. And so somewhere I, I personally feel like we have answers that we can prefer to the world at large uh, to say, here's another way, uh, or here's a way to sort of work with this. And so in that case, I'm thinking of Kyla's, uh, I think it was Kyla's chat where, where there was a conversation of theater, as theater makers, we keep talking ourselves into jars and to sort of talk ourselves out of those jars once and for, for, for all and to stay in a place where we are always intersecting with education, with, with the construction of you know, society, with politics, with um, the act of consensus building in communities, with the act of personal self-awareness, all of these things that we know. I mean, uh, so that we can constantly start to work at a higher order or we can offer tools to the world, to people, to other people, not theater makers, uh, offer tools to the world that allow them to not always let the conversation go down to the base level, um, to be able to hold in a space, hold conflict in a space together. Um, I, sorry, I'm going off on one here, but I, if we think about how the mob behaves in Julius Caesar, et cetera, that's us, the mob going to the base level, right? But over here to have a more evolved, uh, I'll use this word non-pejoratively for change, a woke mob, uh, people who are able to hold conflict and, and be with each other. Social jazz, I loved Camille's idea. But imagine an entire society that could be social, you know, play social jazz with each other. And so, so I think that, I think that what I'm trying to say over here is that the doing thing for me is, one is how do we, how do we take theater practice, the processes that skill us to be better human beings uh, out of our space and to more people. And that's one thing that I think that we should be doing uh, in individual capacities and in an organized way. Um, I think that for me, the idea, and I'll give you one example, but this idea of this plural university, multi-university, rhizomatic university that is going on in the chat window is I think that there should be training or skilling uh, or the ability to create more and more people who look at theater practice as social engineering. Uh, not to just be theater to make plays and theater to create. So that's equally valid because the act of creation is the act of, the act of creation is the act of storytelling and storytelling lies catharsis. Also the ability to provide these tools to people so everybody can tell their own stories and we can start hearing each other's stories. And yes, I am thinking very large scale. I am thinking very sort of kumbaya, but I also find that the digital medium the ability for us all to see each other, be with each other in this space has allowed for, has allowed for many more people to, who are looking for answers to find answers and we should put ourselves out there as one set of possible answers. Um, and that's my provocation. But I'm going to go back to Shankar. So, and, and I'll use two, two visuals. One is that there was a conversation about, sorry, loud motorcycle. Uh, there was a conversation about the global south and about post-colonialism um, with Mandla and with uh, Mark. And they talked about how uh, South Africa is kind of navigating its way through the ruins of, of colonialism. And, you know, you can just imagine a new society forming on the ruins of colonialism. And I think this is a way of maybe us forming a new way of thinking on the ruins of whatever these vertical structures are and capitalism has given us. And that's one. But the other conversation that came back was a conversation with uh, Shankar who happened a couple of weeks ago, where there was a very great value in stillness and doing nothing. And I'm fully aware that this, what do we do next, et cetera, is coming from a place of we've got to do something, we've got to do something. You know, some people are feeling it and I've got to create, other people are creating, why am I not creating, et cetera. And I'm, I'm scared that in this moment where I feel like answers are coming to me, 
but it's also coming from a it's coming from an internal impulse to do something about it to to get on with it to seize this moment and to hear the call of all of these people saying there's got to be a better way to to do things and to start answering that call in whatever way we can um have i missed it or have i lost it or have i missed a possible deeper answer because i didn't sit still for the time that was required to sit still and see if there was an answer there so these are the this is what i'm i'm at and this is what i want to leave the room with but somewhere in all of this i actually think that there is a call to action for theater makers at large we've all been saying the same thing differently and i hear it but we've also been having different experiences and we all have different needs to address to our communities around us but i do think we have to talk ourselves out of the jar and find our way find out the way to bring the things that we know and love to do and we know work and have meaning and give them to many many more people I just want to come in here uh, Kyla before you do please don't forget your thought and um officially say that we usually end at quarter past the hour it is now 20 past the hour but we have an after party and I would like to segue us into the after party and all that means is that the recording will stop but the conversation can continue and anybody who needs to um leave it may very more than welcome to do so but I really want to thank everyone for being here and please stay so it's a it's a thank you so that you know it's recorded that we were here and it was wonderful <laughs> um but it's also a real invitation to stick around and to con con 